Hello and welcome to everyone joining us from the Vancouver and Los Angeles metropolitan regions and who knows perhaps the world over. I want to thank you for joining us today for today's installment of this fall's seminar series hosted by the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University and UCLA's Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. My name is Dimitris Kralis. I'm a professor of Byzantine history in the Department of Humanities at Simon Fraser University. And I'm also the director of the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies. In a moment, I will introduce today's moderator, my esteemed colleague and head of the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, Professor Sharon Gerstel. But before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that all of us participating in this event from Simon Fraser University work on the unceded traditional territories of the Swamis, Slaytooth, Musqueam, and Kwikwetlam peoples. Now, each year at SFU, we invite leading scholars working in Hellenic studies around the world to present their research on a wide range of Hellenic topics, including archeology, span classics, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern Greek history, as well as literary and cultural studies. This year, a gentle nudge by my colleague, Professor Sharon Gerstel at UCLA, led to a new collaboration with UCLA's Stavros Nyakos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, a collaboration which hopes to bring together communities in the United States and Canada to consider exciting work on all aspects of Hellenic studies. I'm thus really pleased to introduce today's moderator, Professor of Byzantine Art and Archaeology and Director of UCLA's Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture, Dr. Sharon Gerstel. For, for those who may not know her, Sharon's work focuses on the intersection of ritual and art in Byzantium and the Latin East. Her main monographs and edited books include Beholding the Sacred Mysteries, that came out in 1999, Rural Lives and Landscapes in Late Byzantium, Art and Archaeology, Art, Archaeology and Ethnography. The later is a true treasure of a book that was widely recognized for its contribution to our field and was awarded the 2016 Runciman Prize by the Anglo-Hellenic. As a, a graduate of Green Mark College and as an ardent feeling, Sharon has a deep connection to the subject of to lecture. So without further ado, I would now like to give a warm, warm welcome to our moderator, Sharon Gerstel. Thank you so much, Demetrius. I would like to affirm how excited we are about this new collaboration with the Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. And I'm particularly pleased to be working with my fellow Byzantinist whose work I esteem so much. And more about that in our second event, which will take place in the spring. We are looking forward to doing great things together and uniting the communities of Los Angeles and Vancouver. I'm very pleased today and honored to present Professor Artemis Leondis as our speaker for today's seminar and as the inaugural lecturer for our new collaborative programming. Artemis Leondis is C.P. Kavafi Professor of Modern Greek and Comparative Literature, Chair of the Department of Classical Studies and Director of the Modern Greek Program at the University of Michigan. She is the author of Eva Palmer Sikelianos, A Life in Ruins, published in 2019, Culture and Customs of Greece, published in 2009, and Topographies of Hellenism, Mapping the Homeland. And she's also editor or co-editor of What These Ithacas Mean, Readings in Kavafi, and Greece, a Traveler's Literary Companion. She's currently creating a digital archive and editing a book of the correspondence of Emo Eva Palmer with Natalie Barney, Colette, René Vivienne, and others who were players in the cultural scene of early 20th century Paris. In today's talk, Professor Leondis will discuss her experiences going after Eva Palmer Sekelianos in the double sense of pursuit and succession. She will recount some of her adventures pursuing the hidden archival resources of Palmer's life and then foreground the stakes of modern encounters with the ancient Greeks in the light of spectrums of meaning found in Palmer's legacy. Before I invite Professor Leondis to begin her presentation, however, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about Simon Fraser University's Zoom privacy and security guidelines, 
I would ask you to visit the SFU IT Services website, whose link can be found in the same email provided access to this webinar. At the conclusion of the lecture, we will host a question and answer session. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, and we will try our best to address them all afterwards. During the Q&A session, if you would like to ask a question verbally, please use the raise your hand button and one of our techs will unmute you. I'm now very, very pleased to welcome Professor Artemis Leondis. Hello, everyone. It is a great honor to be a guest of the two Stavros Niarchos Foundation Centers at distinguished universities on the West Coast, and especially uh, to be invited by Dimitris Kralis, who was formerly a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and Sharon Gerstel, who is a uh, who also has told me that she spent some time at our university. Thank you for this invitation. And again, it is a great honor and exciting to see the beginning of your collaboration. I'm also grateful to Simos Zinos, who's the Associate Director of the UCLA Center and to other people who have helped to prepare the ground for this uh, highly mediated webinar. So my visit was initially planned to be an actual visit to UCLA. And uh, we started talking about this with Professor Gerstel uh, in March, just before we realized that we were in the middle of a pandemic. And so, uh, so the um, in-residence portion of this is left out. And of course, it was something that I was looking forward to, particularly to be able to come into contact with the larger community, because this is a piece of the work that I do at the University of Michigan that I really treasure. Uh, I also feel that I'm at a slight disadvantage because uh, although you can see me, I cannot see anyone in this room. And so it's incumbent upon me to fill the virtual interaction with materials, images, and stories by which we come to know the subject of a life. As already stated, I will be talking about my experiences of going after Eva palmer Sikelianos first in the sense of pursuit and then of succession. I don't remember a time when I didn't know about her. She was a book character in my life from my youth. I was born into a family of readers. My parents filled the room that we called the library with books about Greece. They were American born Greeks. Uh, children of Greek immigrants who had reached the United States in the early 1900s. They only learned that they could speak to their American friends with pride about their Greek ethnic origins during World War II when the Greeks defeated the Italians. After the war, the United States deliberately stressed its long-standing historical, political, cultural and military ties with Greece based on a common Western heritage and shared political values rooted in ancient, that is classical, Greece. My parents bought, sought out books that elaborated on those shared values and especially books that developed the view that Greeks of the present manifested those values and Americans could learn a lot from their old world culture. Athene, the American magazine of Hellenic thought, which you see on your screen, was one of the volumes that I found on their shelves. The 1943 issue had a special section on the life and work of Greek poet Angelos Sikelianos. It was written by Eva Palmer Sikelianos, who identified as Angelos Sikelianos' American wife. She was always a little bit in his shadow. Somewhere I saw this photograph of Sikilianos with Elva Palmer literally in his shadow. More important, she was made to exemplify the, war, 
the role of American support for Greece. And now I'll be quoting uh, from the book. I'll be doing that in different places, but um, very integrated into the talk that I'm giving. So in multiple publications, her post-war story was made to signify American-Greek relations in this free world alliance. It played out the imaginary juncture I'm sorry, it played out at the Amer imaginary juncture of American Greek mutual support. Eva Ingangelos personified all that was good about the alliance. The account evolved as a kind of romantic morality tale in which the lone bright thread of falling in love abroad dominates the rich fabric of a woman's existence, overpowering many other strands. By this account, Eva, the beautiful American woman of good pedigree and noble feelings longed for deep learning and freedom. She entered Bryn Mawr College to study Greek and Latin. She also performed on the stage. In New York and Paris, she lived among rich and famous people. Then for some time, she lost her way in the unspecified excesses of fin de siècle Paris. The turning point was her encounter with Penelope Sikilianos, a Greek woman also of fine pedigree, uh, married to the American Raymond Duncan. When Penelope met Eva, she sensed that she had found a match for her brother. So she took Eva to Greece to introduce her to Angelo Sikilianos, and it was love at first sight. And from that moment, the lean young American with the long braid of red hair and the tall, handsome Greek recognized that they were meant for each other. Thus formed a significant American partnership with Angelos as a god in Eva's eyes. This was a recurring theme uh, who led her with surety to her destination, which was Hellenism. In return, she gave him her unfaltering support. Her generosity extended to all of Greece with the Delphic festivals, festivals of drama and games that filled with new life the spectacularly located ancient Delphi, an archaeological site whose exquisite theater, which you see in front of you, was only excavated a few decades earlier at the turn of the century. The revivals of the ancient festivals took place in two days in May 1927, and then for three successive weeks in May of 1930, with thousands of mostly foreign guests. In the collaboration, Angelos gave the inspiration and Eva insisted that he was the most important contribution, though the performers recognized the substantive role that she had played and lifted her in triumph at the end of the second festival. Her excessive liberality impoverished, but also purified her. She left for America to raise funds for the Delphic festivals and was unsuccessful. When she returned to Greece in 1952, she seemed otherworldly, if not saintly. Visiting the ancient theater of Delphi again during her lost days, her body matched the condition of the surrounding ruins while her clear gaze looking beyond the camera to an infinite point on the horizon suggested that she had achieved transcendence. She died a few days later, received a state funeral at the metropolis of Athens and was bur buried at Delphi. After her death, school children would regularly visit the cemetery at Delphi to lay a wreath on her grave. She became a kind of national hero. Eventually the site of her house next to the cemetery in Delphi was turned into a museum. And so from my Greek American youth, I came to see this version of her story. And here I want to stop and say that I'm presenting you with these five points of her story. Of course, they're a little bit arbitrary, um, but it's a way for us to keep track of the story that I received and then how my pursuit of that story added twist to it so that we come to a different sort of reckoning than the one that I have already presented to you. So um, a piece about her as a New York debutante, wife of Angelo Sigelianos, lover of everything Greek, producer of the Delphic festivals, and then an advocate for Greece during World War II and after. In 2007, I determined to go after Eva Palmer Sigelianos. 
I found an opening in both new research that was being done on the contribution of Anglo-American classicism to women, uh, by, of, uh, by women like Eva Palmer, who worked in the margins of the field, and in the publication of small portions of Eva Palmer's intimate correspondence with fellow American uh, author and performer, Natalie Clifford Barney. Anyway, no one had really explored the resources of her life outside the hagiographic framework that had sanctified, diminished, and distorted her story. My sense was that a systematic tracking down and research of the records of her life would help to identify the missing elements, to contextualize them historically, and to produce a different narrative. It would lead to developing a fuller understanding of the legacy, not only of Eva Palmer Sikilenos, but also of 20th century classicism, neo-Hellenism, and philhellenism from a transnational feminist perspective with attention to the otherness of people like herself and to the power dynamics that shaped and marginalized her. To reckon with the legacy uh, required pursuing her remains. My pursuit began in 2007. I was dedicated, I dedicated all of my research time and much of my other free time to following the, trace, uh, the traces of her life. I visited archives, libraries, houses in the US, Paris, and Greece. I studied collections of papers, letters, photographs, composition notebooks, manuscripts, newspaper articles, weavings, threads, clothes, materials, and paths in Greece in order to come to know who she was according to what she left behind. It was time consuming and never really entirely fulfilling because I found both too little and too much, more at least than my specific skill set could process. It was always overwhelming, but there was enough, there were enough crucial discoveries leading to new byways uh, with more discoveries to keep me in pursuit. So I've presented to you the five faces of Eva Palmer Sigilenos, and now I will work through them. The new debut, the, the New York debutante. Eva Palmer Sikilenos was indeed a New York debutante, heralding from a well-established American East Coast family in New York City, which made money in the hardware business and in real estate. Her parents were free thinkers and creative. Their wealth was not especially great, but it gave Eva Palmer freedom of movement and access to a set of very creative people in high society. She gained entry to Bryn Mawr College by passing a very rigorous exam. But I found she was expelled after two years by the president of the school, M. Carey Thomas. In a letter that still exists in the president's files and is addressed directly to her, accusing her of some unnamed thing that was strictly forbidden. From her adolescence, Eva Palmer knew that she loved women. She became one of a small group a very influential woman who worked to create a genealogy and creative future for women who loved women. This was a group of very articulate creative women who exchanged hundreds of pages of letters in which they wrote out what they read, felt, thought, experienced, imagined, and hoped for a different future. They acknowledged the obstacles to the love they felt and hoped uh, for something that was yet to come. Eva Palmer's chief correspondent was Natalie Clifford Barney, her lover of at least seven years, if not a little more than a decade. Barney was the force at the center of the group. She also happened to be a pack rat. She kept the many letters that she received from Eva Palmer together with a large stack of Eva's of her own letters and others that were sent to Eva Palmer, which Eva Palmer handed to her when the relationship ended. Almost as soon as I began archival research on Eva Palmer's Sikelianos' biography, I knew that the integrity of the project depended on my gaining access to this correspondence. Intimate records are an area that biographers must treat with utmost respect. Biography, in my view, should not require chasing down 
every detail of a subject's intimate relationships. But it does need to cover the course of intimate ties that inform intellectual development and personal choice. Eva Palmer's lifetime investment in Greece was, deeply, uh, was a deeply motivated thing. A strongly motivating force came from her reading of the archaic Greek poet Sappho in ancient Greek. She and Barney and company read the, into the gaps of Sappho's poetry to create a modern lesbian identity. Since I can only give you a course review of a few discoveries today, I will take you through a series of photographs indicating both the, record, the effort that was exerted to close this material off without, however, destroying it, and the significant record of Eva Palmer's intimacy with women and the richness of the sources. And so here we see two of the archival boxes of Eva Palmer Sikelianos' papers in the Center for Asia Minor Studies, an archive I note that has absolutely nothing to do with Eva Sikelianos. The boxes themselves were marked me prosito. They were, there, were not to, there was not to be access to them, at least until the year 2020. The picture shows the marking. Uh, and I, can, I note that the boxes themselves were in the back of a closet in the deepest resource of the deepest, darkest room. Opening one box, I found a set of folders. And opening any one of those folders, I found letters tied with ribbons and threads from the early 1900s. Some of the letters were filled with mud. Others were running with dried tears, from, from tears. Here are two of the many stacks of 600 levels, letters I counted and eventually archived and digitized. The letters were one of the records of Eva Palmer's participation in the group. Photographs were another, and here is where her performance role is apparent specifically in the effort to revisit and revise iconic female roles. The following photograph has veiled nudity. I'm letting you know this in advance. I include it because it offers a deeply creative, humorous, and beautiful revision of the iconography of the Christian Annunciation. Natalie Barney is sitting on a throne in the place of the Virgin Mary, and Eva Palmer approaches her like an angel, offering a lily, <clears throat> and with Barney offering a lily, symbol of purity and a sign of the world's rejuvenation. What's important to remember is the attention the scene places on artistic prototypes and to the reperformance of them through careful attention to replicating familiar poses um, that recontextualizes them. The same principle applies to the photograph in which Eva Palmer, seen on the left, is reading in an armchair dressed in high fashion. I've placed this next to a line drawing that was circulating in Eva Palmer's youth in publications of Sappho's poetry. The drawing was taken from a vase painting showing Sappho reading or someone reading Sappho which is housed in the National Archaeological Museum in Greece. Seen alongside the image of Sappho reading, we read the photograph of Eva Palmer as one depicting her as both a reader of Sappho and one aspiring to, to bring Sappho into the present. Eva Palmer and Natalie Barney carried the principle of repurposing old roles to produce a new vocabulary for a, the lesbian life they were imagining um, that was not yet socially available to them. Some of their work was more ambitious and took the form of performances that many actors, or that, that is, friends, uh, participated in. For example, Natalie Barney's Equivoque performed in Barney's Garden in the suburbs of Paris in 1906 retells the received biography of Sappho to turn the story of her suicidal leap from the white rocks of Lethgas for her unrequited love of Phaon, a male character, into one of unrequited but ultimately fulfilled love for Timas, a female character in Sappho's corpus whose role is fleshed out and performed by Eva Palmer, whom you see kneeling second figure from the left. 
So going to the second point in the story, the wife of Angelos Sikelianos. The hidden correspondence also gives a new twist to the story of how Eva Palmer traveled to Greece and became Angelos Sikelianos' wife, which is the second key element in her received story. In the correspondence, Angelos is not the beacon of light illuminating Eva Palmer's path and pointing her in the direction that re remove her from her life of decadence. At about the time when Eva Palmer was working with Natalie Barney to stage Equivoque, she met the Greek woman, Penelope Sikilenos, seen in the middle here, with Raymond Duncan uh, and their child. This was a welcome meeting, especially because her relationship, because Eva's relationship with Natalie Barney was strained and she was looking for new inspiration. The couple was as passionate as Eva Palmer about Greece as a source of inspiration for new modes of living. They were also fundamentally countercultural. What they offered Eva Palmer that she did not already know and that had not even occurred to her was direct experience of Greece as a place where people actually lived. At a moment of great vulnerability, Eva Palmer accepted the invitation of Penelope Sikilenos to travel to Greece and stay in the village of Kopanos outside Athens in the half-built house of the Duncans. And we see her uh, dressed in a handwoven dress, her first handwoven dress, uh, um, on Mount Imitos. This was where her first meeting with Angelos Sikelenos took place. The correspondence does not suggest any emotional excitement for Angelos, only the continuing sharp pain of heartbreak as Eva Palmer tried to come to terms with disappointments in her relationship with Barney and countering this, a growing love for the landscape and uh, social life of Greece. For the next year, she anticipated that she would return to Paris and be with Barney if Barney could offer her the slightest tenderness once again. Instead, Barney continued to treat her harshly. And then during a return visit to Paris the following summer, when Eva Palmer brought Angelos Sikelenos with her so that the Sikelenoses, Barney and Palmer might all become friends, Barney was particularly insulting to the Sikilanoses in a way that showed her class snobbery and ethnic disdain. This was the breaking point for Eva Palmer. She informed Barney that she intended to take Angelo Sikilanos to the US to introduce him to her parents and left a tuft of her extraordinary red hair as a gift of mourning to Barney. Barney wrote a desperate letter promising change. The laconic response from Eva Palmer serving as an announcement for her marriage is a telegram with the words, cannot do as you ask, already married lovingly, Eva. So now we move to the third characteristic or element of her life, lover of everything Greek. Elinolatris, worshiper of, Greek, of Greece and Greek things, is an adjective I have often read or heard attached to the name of Eva Palmer Sikilianos by people in Greece. The word captures something of her affective attachment. I think it is accurate, accurate uh, in capturing the spiritualism and mythic attachments to the past that it suggests. There is also something in the pose in her stance. I've already indicated the significance she attached to posing during the period of her life when she was developing the grammar and iconography of the lesbian life. My research gave me more insights into the significance of the pose as she expanded her performance repertoire to develop an attitude of the expatriated American and Greek wife. Well, 
My research of all of Eva Palmer's papers, including the Center for Asia Minor Studies, but also the official archive of 54 large archival boxes um, in the Benaiki Museum Historical Archives, and the larger body of works on women's education and exercise of self during the era of her youth helped me to flesh this out. Here I pick up again from some pages in the book that I had written. There was something mythical in Eva's attitude. It was mythical first in the conventional sense of a meaningful piece of fiction. From the evidence that I have gathered of her conjugal life with Angelos Sikilenos during those first years of marriage, she and Angelos shared a passion for ideas. I never once felt unexpressed when he was speaking, she later said. For a while, there was physical intimacy. There was also emotional intimacy as Angelos would return from long trips to tell her stories, wonderful stories, but Amethia, fairy stories, with a winning smile in a language she absolutely adored. She confessed her love for Angelo in her last love letter to Barney when she asked Barney to end their, com their correspondence. She was happy, she said, though she felt things might fall apart. My happiness hangs on a thread. I've worked against such odds in myself to make Angelo believe his belief has come so hard. And now that I believe myself, it would be too cruel to have him doubt again. In March 1909, less than two years after their marriage, when she was 35 years old and he was 25, she bore Angelos a son. They named him Glafkos after Glafki or Glafkomata, Angelos is named for Eva. Then in 1912, she reportedly asked Angelos to end their sexual intimacy, and she agreed that he should take a mistress. She did not cease to satisfy his other desires. She supported him for the rest of her life, even when she was impoverished and forced to wash her own sheets by hand. She remained devoted especially to his poetic talents, the restless itinerant, Angelo stayed away for long periods. In the years when they were together, Eva's American acquaintances traveling in Greece commented on the distance between them, but also on the pleasures Eva took in weaving and in a thousand more personal activities, building, planting, sewing, and wine making while he was absent. Eva Sikelianos' attitude or pose was also, also mythical in another important way. She emerged from a world in which American women in much higher percentages than men received training in the practice of what was called mythical posing in their study of physical education and the performing arts. Mythical posing was the production of a bodily attitude imitating the ancient statue as performed by the followers of Francois Delsart. Late 19th century mythical posing can be compared to late 20th century music video voguing, the postmodern play of simulacra paying homage to statue poses and early advertising and silent film. Both voguing and mythical posing drew on Delsartian techniques, but the similarities end there. Though a representation of a representation, mythical posing was a piece of somatic theory and practice that aspired to achieve not surface play, but spiritual depth. Delsartians believed in the human soul that was eternal, in a human soul that was eternal, though covered with mortal flesh. Human flesh restricted the soul in space, time, and motion. Yet the soul, the immortal, immaterial part of the human body, could raise bodily expression to amazing heights and nuances of emotion, reuniting the body with an undying life under the right conditions. Delsartians found an artistic expression in ancient myths, Greek, Indian, and Egyptian, as examples of human expression that united the material with the spiritual world. They trained modern bodies to work against the grain of the modern day's too glib confidence in material progress. 
to ready themselves for a richer, more fulfilling self-expression through the study of ancient myths. By study, they meant bodily discipline, the careful replication of time-tested bodily poses as exemplified by ancient figures from statues and vase paintings to Greek letters and European and Egyptian gestural hieroglyphs as a means of reaching a more vital source of life. The historic trends of mythical posing linked Eva to important dancers of her day, Isadora Duncan, sister of Raymond Duncan and sister-in-law of Penelope Sigillanos, Ruth St. Dennis, Ted Sean, and Martha Graham, all artists with whom she had contact in the di at different stages in her life. I will say more about the pose in the next section on the Delphic festivals. Here I need to underscore, underscore too quickly and succinctly, I fear, another crucial dimension of her Greek life that has not been emphasized. Her approach to Greek life, which fixated on poses found in ancient art, equally emphasized the significance of creative processes that were available to people living today and the economic and, and the economic and cultural independence of marginalized people like the Greeks. She was dedicated to helping Greeks find the path of their own creative output, which would not be beholden to Western European imports or American trends. Her words, the loom is everything, signified that Greeks should not model their modern creative life on imitations of ancient art, but instead embrace their roles as creators and world makers. She was equally dedicated to their embracing non-Western traditions in music that were their own, such as Byzantine church chant, which she mastered and advocated. And that is a huge accomplishment, I have to say. As a model for resisting the invasion of Western art forms that replaced native traditions. While there was something idealistic and unrealistic in her advocacy of, ret of the return to weaving, especially among urban women of Athens, there was also something anti-colonialist in the enterprise. And in fact, it was directly influenced through her transnational contact with Korshed Nawroji, an elite woman from Mumbai and fellow musician who came to study with her in Athens for six months in order to learn Byzantine music. Uh, so it was mediated through Korshed Nawroji uh, to reach to um, Gandhi and his anti-colonial uh, independence movement. So the fourth element in her life is her role as a producer and artistic director of the Delphic festivals. The direction Eva Palmer gave to, Delphic to the Delphic festivals do, drew on all the resources that I have outlined so far in pursuing the sources of her life. Excuse me, all the, all the sources I have outlined so far. In pursuing the sources of her life, I came to recognize that while Angelos Sikelanos invested the Delphic festivals with a set of philosophical and indeed spiritualist and occultist ideas, Eva Palmer Sikelanos gave the festivals dramatic presentation their artistic shape. And to do this, she drew on what she had learned in other stages of her life. The choreography has its roots in American and British women's performances of Greek sources, especially her training in the methods of Del Sart, mentioned a few minutes ago. And in the development of the art inspired but world transforming pose in les as a lesbian performer. The choreography, her choreography of um, and here I'm looking at the, the play by Aeschylus um, or the pseudo Aeschylean uh, Prometheus Bound, the, the, uh, the first play that she uh, staged. 
So its choreography has its roots in American and British performances of Greek sources, especially her training in the methods of Del Sartre mentioned uh, before uh, and the work that she was doing um, as a lesbian performer. So it started, it would always start with drawings from face paintings. And here you can see um, the drawing by the artist Bella Raftopoulou, whom Eva Palmer Sigelenos hired to go to the National Museum and trace um, the drawings on vase paintings. Then Eva Sigelenos would work to replicate the shapes on the drawings and develop movements from them. And here from another angle, you can see almost the same gesture as it becomes movement. Uh, the character is Io, the woman who was raped by Zeus and then turned into a cow to escape the wrath of Hera, who then sent a gadfly to torment her. So if we uh, go back to some of the earlier slides, we can see that just as in the photography uh, from 1900, where she is reshaping her own body uh, after a line drawing of a vase painting of Sappho in order to create, to recreate and revive and bring into modern life um, a pose and a mythical attitude and a, the potential of the, the Greek um, line drawing. Uh, we also see in uh, her choreography of the Delphic festivals, uh, the same effort taking a line drawing and turning it into a bodily pose and then turning it into a performance. Eva Palmer Sikilenos's direction of the, the Prometheus Bound was also very likely, uh, also very likely incorporated a reference to India's anti-colonialist independence movements as a sign of the kind of Greek national cultural independence that she wished to assert through the Delphic festivals. Her progressive commitments to matters of social and economic justice is most evident in one small detail of her weaving of the costumes. Uh, one particular choice signaled a directorial de uh, decision that diverged from her fixation on archaic Greek sources, mixing into the production, a piece of India's decolonization movement. A letter to Korshed Nawaji, who's the figure I showed you earlier in um, the Gate of the Lions at Mycenae. So in a letter to Korshed Nawaji, she reveals that she asked Korshed to help her acquire a yoga costume of hand-spun cloth for one of the costumes of the play. Writing from Mumbai on September 16, 1925, Korshed enclosed a um, white dyed sample of cloth um, and a description of the, of the garment with a drawing. Uh, which was supposed to be a single long tunic with long sleeves, uh, just about the ankles with two slits on the side. She herself offered to have it spun, woven and dyed in India um, through the Kadi movement and to send uh, the costume to Eva. I have not discovered if this yoga costume actually reached Greece, but I do believe that it was part of the 1927 performance whether as an actual garment spun and dyed in India or as a costume which she wove herself according to Korshed's instructions. I conjecture that Eva used the costume for Prometheus. So here I want to contrast uh, the costumes of Oceanus and some of the other uh, spiritual members, the spirits that were members of the, uh, of the cast whose costumes were in silk and had a uh, very elaborate embroidery that was drawn from uh, the decorations on vase paintings with the simple garment of Prometheus. The actor in this costume literally embodies the process of hand spinning, dyeing and weaving that were the centerpiece of India's Swadeshi movement for the country's economic independence. 
and added a current international politicized dimension to Prometheus's performance of anticipated liberation. By conjuring the contemporary dimensions of Pr Prometheus's performance of anticipated liberation, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, by conjuring the contemporary image of Gandhi leading a real national revolution against the harsh colonial rule of his country, dressed in this simple hand spun cloth. She indicated solidarity with India's pe uh, pe peasants and unsettled the mythologizing slippage between archaic Greek archaeological prototypes and living Greek bodies. This was the case even in its precise prototype, let alone masked political message um, as it, if it escaped the notice of the audience. Okay, so I'm moving now to the fifth element of the received life of Eva Palmer Sigilenos, her advocacy for Greece or her Philhellenic advocacy uh, after she returned to the United States. The last face of Eva Palmer Sigilenos that my work explored is her advocacy for Greece, especially in the last phase of her life. The records of this work are in her official archive at the Benaiki Museum Historical Archives and also other sources connected with the American State Department. Her worldview became decidedly political with a proto with a pro democratic and anti fascist turn during World War II, when she was living in poverty, supported by a few American friends and in growing dialogue with Greeks and Greek Americans who shared with her information about the AOM resistance movement in Greece. A turning point was a letter that she received from Yorgos Seferiadis, better known as the poet George Seferis, who was then working in the Department of Information in the Greek government in exile in Cairo. The letter placed in the hands of Eva Sigelianos the Acritica, a collection of resistance poems by Angelo Sigelianos, which had been circulating secretly in Nazi occupied Greece and illegally crossed the border. Uh, reaching Switzerland and then Egypt. Seferis sent photo uh, copies of, of the photographed copies of the manuscript and Eva immediately went to work to arrange for the translation and publication of the poems. They arrived in Mar late March of 1944, just as Greece's resistance politics was becoming extremely complicated in exactly the same ways that the wartime collaboration of the US, Britain, and the Soviet Union was becoming complicated in anticipation of the division of spheres of, limp, of influence uh, that would shape the world. Her writing turned now turned political, she sent thousands of letters, some of them very long, protesting each step of US politics. And following Britain's anticipating the destruction that would follow and pointing to the ensuing damage she had previously predicted. Already in January, on January 12, 1945, PM, a New York Daily tabloid reported that Mrs. Eva Palmer had sent at least 2,000 letters in Gr on Greece in her single-handed campaign to educate Americans about her adopted country. Her archive from this period, a carefully selected record of her incoming and outgoing correspondence, shows that she was in dialogue with hundreds of people besides politicians on matters of politics and culture. There were Greek Americans of all walks of life who wrote in response to her open letters, articles, and radio appeals, including a small group that approached her to preside over the Greek American Council, perhaps the first Greek American lobbying organization formed to pressure the American government against acquiescence to British actions in Greece and against American aid in the gov um, aid to the government fighting the communist insurgency and insisting on the return of King Paul. There were people in the theater 
literature, and the arts, from Paul Robeson to W.E.B. Du Bois, who identified themselves as anti in the, with the anti-imperialist movement in the US and wrote to her in solidarity, asking her to take part in the convening of the American People's Congress for a lasting peace in support of a firm alliance of the United Nations. There were writers and translators of modern Greek, Ray Dalvin, Kimon Fryer, Philip Sherard, authors of books on contemporary Greece, Henry Miller, archeologists, Leslie Shearer, classicists and historians, L. Estavianos, composers and performers of non-Western music, Ravi Shankar, and popularizers of ancient Greek literature and culture. The list is broad and extensive. Many shared a belief that solidarity was important irrespective of the specific cause. And people were called on to come together. Eva Sikelenos became a kind of node and the network of crisscrossing groups who viewed America's post-war emergence as a world power from angles other than the official one and who felt pressed to speak an authoritative lang language of knowledge to power. Her outspoken anti-imperialist pro-democratic stance was judged to be anti-American, as this document shows. Uh, and it shows her name placed alongside that of Leonard Bernstein, W.E.B. Du Bois, Albert Einstein, Thomas Mann, Dorothy Parker, and other eminent artists, scientists, and writers. When the time came for her to be recruited by the American embassy in Greece, which knew nothing of this history, to return to Greece as an iconic figure alongside Angelos Sikelianos in order to pr promote a new set of Delphic festivals as part of America's Marshall Plan, she was denied a visa. She was deemed too dangerous for both Greece and the United States. Her return was held up for months, and in the meantime, Angelos Sigelanos died, and her own health broke down. And thus it happened that she returned to Greece, a heartbroken woman, unable to understand how all the many stages of her efforts to live and promote a Greek life could have been so deeply misunderstood. So I now return to the narrative outlined of Eva Palmer's life, which I inherited in my youth. And I highlight the revisions I have made by going after Eva Palmer Sikilianos. We can see that each element of the story remains in place but in a way that acknowledges the radical alterity of her life, which was not captured by the hagiographic narrative. The New York debutante, debutante was a queer performer. She was Bryn Mawr College educated until she dropped out. And she was a lesbian performer who worked at creating a di an identity uh, for women who loved women in the 20th century. She fell in love with Greece and possibly Penelope Sikelianos, but married Angelos Sikelianos. She was a countercultural dresser and performer of non Western arts. She promoted weaving to oppose the fashion industry and to support Greek economic self-reliance. She mastered and promoted Byzantine music as a piece of preserving non-Western music. She was a producer and director of the transnational Delphic festivals, which brought in influences from all of the stages of her life. When she left Greece, she left in debt. And she was particularly heartbroken because Sikilenos 
disregarded her contribution and claimed that the Delphic festivals were all his own. She was an American Philhellenic advocate, but not in the way that the Cold War narrative shaped her. She was anti-fascist, anti-imperialist, blacklisted in 1949, denied a visa for the Greek homecoming, and returned in 1952, broken, um, uh, and was buried in Delphi. One meaning of going after Eva Palmerci Gilenos is the pursuit of the resources of her life to fill in and adjust her story. Another meaning of after is, of course, temporal succession. The legacies we inherit. Eva Palmer came before me. She died before I was born. I discovered her fairly early in my life when leafing through my parents' books and magazines. In a few of these, she appeared as a shadowy figure alongside Angelo Sicilianos. She was eccentrically dressed. I developed the professional desire to treat my coming temporarily, temporarily after her with a purpose to track down her remains and reckon with her legacy. In my work, I have framed this reckoning as a transnational from a transnational feminist perspective with attention to its otherness and to the power dynamics that both shaped and marginalized her. I'm still in the process of trying to understand all that has come out in this immense project, but I want to end by highlighting three points. Eva Palmer Sikelianos placed Greece at the center of a vision that was lifestyle and interpersonally based and sought to recover what was endangered and lost in modern life. Her life and the archives she left behind foregrounds communities of interpreters, many of them marginal figures, and I include in that category of mar marginal figures, the modern Greeks with whom she was in direct dialogue. They were people who pursued the Greek as something interrelational, personal, in some cases queer, in other cases countercultural, and always untimely and current with rich, rich resources from which to draw out the possibilities of futurity. I think that her story opens up large avenues to explore regarding the place of Greece, um, the place that Greece has played in modern lives. I also want to emphasize that Greece after her vision is decidedly not the stuff of hagiography. Its study calls for a critical practice that works against dominant narratives and embraces the queerness and radical otherness. In, mar in marginal lives. So that's the end of my talk. And I really welcome hearing from you uh, any kinds of questions that um, are in of interest to you that come to your minds, any um, supplementary ideas, any thoughts, any uh, differences. Uh, I hope that we can have some kind of a dialogue. Artemis, I, I want to thank you for that spectacular lecture. I want to thank you even more for your book, which I have at home and is marked up and has led to so many interesting directions for my own thinking about Greece. And there are many questions coming up, but I wanted to start by asking about what you describe as her, that she is the node in networks of crisscrossing groups, which I think is so important to thinking about her. And my question is, she seems to constantly reinvent herself. And I'm wondering if there's some thread that runs through all of those groups that connects her life from beginning to end, or is it constantly taking on something new and discarding the old, like she did in writing a letter to Natalie Barney? Right, that's a really, really great, great question. And um, in fact, in the way that I uh, sort of set this up with these five points in her life, I think it really makes one feel sort of these thin continuities, but also that there is this constant um, self reinvention. And I think um, that the thread that connects all of this is 
that uh, this, so these sort of technologies of self, this self-making uh, that was always in dialogue with the Greek, whether it was Sappho uh, or it was Angelos Sigelenos in his poetry, or it was weaving or music uh, or the Deflect festivals uh, and other stage productions um, or her own engagement with politics, that, uh, that all of this is part of a process of self-making and that the real project uh, was living this kind of ph philosophy of living the life in readiness for the next step. Um, I think it's really interesting. We have some books about people like Nietzsche. I'm thinking of um, Alexander Nechamas's book uh, where he talks about philosophy as um, a way of living. Um, and most of the books that we have are um, about men and about philosophers. So we think about this as a philosophical enterprise that is about philosophy. Um, but I think that it's really, really interesting to see this as it plays out in the life of a performer. So the other thread I would say is that she was also always a performer um, with a sense of the real in integrity in her life in the performance. Uh, but, uh, you know, a woman who was not a philosopher, but who read philosophy uh, and who knew philosophers and who, for whom, being ready for whatever came next uh, was part of the project. Thank you. So we have about 79 people in the audience right now, and I'm starting to get some questions coming in. A um, question uh, that I think all of us want to know is what happened to her son, Glavkos? So um, Glavkos uh, is the grandfather of Eleni Sikilianos, the poet, and some of you may know her. Uh, he um, married very young and uh, married an American woman uh, and then moved to the United States. Uh, he, like Eva, was homeschooled and he had a very, very difficult relationship with Angelos, who in the end uh, uh, didn't even really recognize him as the son. And, um, and that la loss of recognition meant that uh, he never became the, he didn't become the uh, he didn't inherit anything uh, in Greece, although everything in Greece um, had been mortgaged by the time uh, Eva died. Anyway, he became a, uh, he was a craftsman and he made sandals. He made a living by making sandals and making small boats uh, and then moved to California. He had a number of children. And as I said, Eleni Sigelianos was uh, one of the grandchildren. Um, so a really um, interesting extension of Eva's uh, life and they were very connected to each other um, and she was always very respectful of him and I think in some ways he is the countercultural uh, hippie child. We have a comment from uh, Mary Hart about how much she enjoyed your lecture just to let you know that she's here. And a question from Jim Baracos, one of our local authors. Uh, remaining re uh, dedicated to Sikelianos, Eva gave her blessing for his marriage to Anna, but Sikelianos felt obligated to ask for her blessing. Although they remained apart, does this show their continued devotion? I think um, from reading the correspondence. I mean, correspondence comes usually when people are not close to each other or when they have a lot to say to each other. And the most of the correspondence with Angelus is um, after she left the United States. Uh, and we see a number of letters in the 1930s when he is really pursuing her and asking her for money. Um, and that is a theme that is repeated. Uh, and she remained always very polite and caring and very dedicated to the project of publishing uh, his complete works. And eventually she hoped uh, she would be able to translate his work. Um, but I think that in the last decade, the correspondence, especially after he had disappeared for a number of years during the war and then reemerged, the, the correspondence um, is uh, very loving. And the moment when he asked for her, um, blessing um and I, you know i'm i'm not it's not really really impressed in my mind 
what his letter exactly said. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I want to say that there was respect and devotion, and I see it um, especially in her correspondence, which I've read in his archive. Uh, and I think that he expressed it to the degree that he was able to do that. So I do not want to deny that. I think that it was a theme that ran to the end of their life. Another question that comes up after saying, thank you very much for your talk, Artemis. You may have mentioned this already, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on one, the challenges you faced tracking down all the archival material given the rich life she led, and two, uh, can you say something about the feminists who reached out to her and followed her performances from Greece or North America? Um, so let's see. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say hello to Mary Hart because I want, and I want to acknowledge that I've been in dialogue with Mary uh, since uh, we had a workshop here uh, and that I have really benefited from her work. Uh, and in fact, um, the two of the slides that I showed, the, the Oceana slides came from uh, one of her presentations. So thank you, Mary. And it's really nice to know that you're there. So um, tracking down is um, a wild pursuit because letters uh, come to a particular place, but they go off in many, many different directions. And, uh, and so it's really hard to know what you'll ever find. Uh, and it's hard also to know um, where to look for it. Uh, so I think some of the, the greatest pleasure I found was in uh, going to Jacob's Pillow and to the archive at Jacob's Pillow and, um, and also to the New York Public Library and finding elements of the work that, that um, she did with Ted Sean and her work in modern dance. Um, that was just a really exciting chapter. Um, the, the, I've shared a lot about uh, the Center for Asia Minor Studies. Um, and it, you know, it was very complicated and very delicate uh, to gain access to the archives. And I think, you know, in part, this was because Ana Siquelianos had really put a lid on that material, um, and that people felt very uh, protective of Ana Siquelianos. So there was a sense, you know, also Ana Siquelianos lived off of uh, the. Um, royalties of Anglo Sigelenos's work and it was a different era and she was afraid that her reputation and Angelos's reputation would be ruined if the lesbian story um, came out. Um, it was, you know, it was interesting to be arguing that case in 2009 um, but I want to say that the last two decades have really been groundbreaking and they were very groundbreaking for myself because I don't think, I'm not sure that when I first started out, I really understood how important those resources would have been. Um, so as far as feminists um, tracking her work, I'm not sure if the question, uh, I, I mean, it's, we're talking, I think, um, posthumously. So actually Eva Siguranos' mother was a suffragette. Uh, and it's interesting that Eva did not really find that particularly interesting and exciting. Uh, she was not interested in her mother's political work. Uh, so, you know, her version of what, um, what a woman wanted and what a, what a woman needed did not align with the first wave uh, of feminism. Um, and, uh, and I think it's really the third wave of feminism that can start to come to terms with um, what portions of her legacy that she may not have even had the language uh, to describe. We have an interesting question from Zafirius uh, Gurguliatus, who's a member of our Los Angeles Greek community, who asks, in early 1900, Mark Twain published the anti-imperialist writings. Have you seen any references in Eva's archives about influences from these writings? I have not seen Mark Twain um, references. Um, I also want to say that I think that each chapter of this life in a way is a book in itself. 
And it requires, I think for me, maybe the most frustrating and the most challenging piece of this work has been uh, the amount of expertise that is really needed to grapple with these things. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there, it, I really, really recognize that there are people who've been working on the, um, on American post-war history and anti-imperialist movements, labor movements before the war, what happened to them afterwards, uh, who would have really interesting things to say about um, the crisscrossing nodes of people and, um, and what is happening in the archive. So thank you for that. Thank you for these, these are incredible questions and I really appreciate it. Um, a question from Katarina Zakaria, professor at Loyola Marymount University. Thank you for your exceptional work, Artemis. Have you ever found that Eva Palmer Sicalianos encountered Nellies? Nellies photographed the Delphic Festival of 1927. The two women had a markedly different arc and I would be very much interested in any information you may have discovered. And before you answer, I should say that our center hosted a lecture about Nellie's last year where Eva's name did come up. And I'm happy to share that lecture with people who are listening to this webcast. Right, right, a wonderful question. And I know um, Katharina's work on, um, on Nellie's. Um, and so, of course, we know that Nellie's was hired to photograph the 1930s uh, Delphic festivals, which were supported and paid for by Andonis um, Benaikis. And, um, and so had an incredible mix of ideology in them, uh, some of which I think uh, is really dependent on fascist uh, iconography. And um, a new book by Leah Papadaki, uh, traces the occult influences on Angelos Sikelianos and his connections with um, fascist and um, and fascist sources and sources that inf sources that in influence the fascist movement and the Nazi movement. Uh, so those threads are very much part, I think, especially of the second festival, but really of Angelo Sigelenos' thinking about the festivals in the 1920s when he took a pretty sharp right-wing turn. Um, I think that Eva Sigelenos herself was fairly apolitical uh, in, at, during this period, except for her um, idealization of India's um, uh, anti-colonialist independence movement. Um, what she really uh, wanted to come out in the festivals, however, was quite, um, was something that I think was a thread that I think was pretty uh, anti-fascist. And that was, and again, I think it was by aesthetic choice and not necessarily by political choice. And that was that she felt that a community, so the, that the, the, the choruses, for example, uh, which are the community responding to the event should not be a community of everyone like-minded and moving in absolute, um, uh, synchronicity, but actually should have been driven by the creative engagement of each of the performance uh, in their work. She didn't exactly achieve this because she couldn't get the um, amateur performers uh, to take on uh, that amount of agency. So, um, so uh, Katharina, in, in answering your question, I mean, there are intersections, there are really important intersections. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, Again, before her uh, fundamentally political move, she expresses herself in several letters as anti-Hitler, anti-Mussolini. Uh, so I don't really think that she was ever really aligned with a kind of um, uh, uh, ideological connection that we see in Nellie's um, uh, in some of Nellie's work in the 1930s. Uh, but I think it's a really important question. Um, more questions about Glafkos. I think we've all been touched with the story of Glafkos. Um, the question is, are there still descendants alive? Um, by extension, how have they received, if there are, um, your reevaluation of her life and legacy? Yeah. So again, I want to point to Eleni Sigilenos, who is the, grand, the grandchild of, of Glafkos, who was very, very close to him. Um, and and quite protective <coughs> and has been quite protective and caring of his legacy. 
Um, and Galafgos, at some point before he died, said that he really, he knew very much about his mother's um, history and about her closeted lesbianism. And he wanted very much for that story to come out because uh, he felt that she was, um, uh, that, that her own, uh, that, that, that she was repressed by, uh, that she was oppressed by uh, the fact that she had to keep it a secret uh, and that the story itself was false uh, to her. So Eleni has been incredibly important and helpful in my writing this book. She is in fact um, the executor of the um, intellectual life of Eva Sigedanos and gave me permission uh, to use materials. Uh, and at the same time, she really learned um, alongside because there were many aspects of the story that she did not know. And I want to say that there are a few other, quite a few other people because Lafkos had many children. I think there's someone by the name of Patsy Kellianos. I come up, I see their work here and there, but I haven't really met anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, a question from another colleague in Modern Greek Studies, Nektaria Klapaki. Thank you for this fascinating talk, Artemis. In the introduction to your book, you pose an important question. How did she know the things she did? You specifically referred to a set of arcane matters she knew about, like how the ancients walked, talked, latched their shoes, etc. I'm particularly interested in the question of how she knew the ancient things she knew, because canonical modernist authors, mostly male, suggested that while the past is not easily or directly accessible by the moderns, it can be accessed intuitively. Did Eva espouse this modernist view about the modern difficult of, difficulty of knowing the past? If not, what was her position on this question? So we have uh, different statements by her at different times, and I think they express um, viewpoints that were evolving. Um, one of the statements that she makes in Upward Panic, which is the book that she wrote to give an accounting of uh, her participation in the Delphic festivals, her involvement in it, and also of her intellectual roots, um, inter intellectual and performance roots, uh, states that um, uh, she was delighted that the audience at the Delphic festivals felt as if she had revived the ancient past, uh, and that that was never what the project actually involved. In other words, she herself was not trying to revive. Uh, she, and, and an archeologist in fact approached her, she, uh, she tells the story in the book, she approached her and said that you have solved uh, problems that archeologists have been trying to solve for a long time uh, and praised her for her archeological correctness. And she said um, that there's no such thing as archeological correctness. There is only the truth of the performance. And so, um, so I think that maybe one of the ideas that I would point to is that for her antiquity was full of gaps. And the thing that one needed to do was to occupy those gaps, uh, was to find where the gaps were and to bring what was not there to life. And that's a pretty abstract thing, but it does align, I think, with, I mean, this is, uh, this is, Nick's idea is a question is um, really significant and I'd love to talk more about this. I mean, I think in some ways it really aligns with modernism, but I think it also is a little bit a Victorian and pre-modernist, uh, or pre-modernist, it's kind of an anti-modernist uh, Victorian uh, attitude about how we occupy um, what is not there. We have many laudatory comments. I just want to pass on one to you um, from Jacqueline Clements. This lecture has been really wonderful. I love the book, as well as your book, Topographies of Hellenism. Thank you for this extraordinary piece of research. Thank um, you, I appreciate it. So one question I have, and maybe Demetrius is thinking the same thing, is about her love of Byzantine chant. Um, and I'm wondering, was she interested in all of Byzantine chant or did she focus on hymnographers like Cassiani, which would make sense to me in terms of the trajectory of her interests? Right, right. And in fact, there's not even any mention of Cassiani in what I have read, but again, I haven't read uh, everything. And also I don't have her letters about 
uh, there's so much that has been lost, you know, anything that she has written about this that would have come in uh, letters, there's so much of her voice um, that is lost. So um, it's really difficult for me to know. I think that she was most interested in the loss, in the strangeness of the sound. Uh, in the very, very different system of music. So she came from a family of musicians. Her brother was a pianist, her mother was a pianist. Um, there was a small orchestra that her mother um, directed in the, that conducted in their house. Uh, she had uh, personal relations with opera singers uh, like Emma Calvey. So she was trained in Western music. And when she heard, um, Penelope, she always talked about Penelope singing. Um, we get different versions of the story, this Greek woman singing, a tropadion uh, from the Byzantine tradition. Uh, she, you know, it, she felt that what she had learned about music was erased and that she wanted to go after, she wanted herself to go after something that had not been part of her own education that opened up a different world. And so, you know, we can look at some of the projects that she funded and patronized. She was uh, very dedicated to Costandinos Psajos, a very difficult man, uh, who was the representative of the most austere neo-Byzantine uh, version of chant and, um, and to educating people in that form of chant in Athens. He was brought from Constantinople to teach that. And she published, she helped him publish books in which he, he explored, um, he tried to show the connection of the neo-Byzantine notation uh, with the Byzantine. So part of this was also, I think, um, influence tracing and part of her um, sort of trying to understand how things had come down um, to Greece. But part of it, I think, was really the musical dimension of it, the sound dimension of it. But it really is quite amazing to recognize that she became a master of Byzantine chant, which meant that she needed to relearn ancient Greek with modern Greek pronunciation, that she needed to learn a whole system of sound, uh, that she needed to learn a whole system of religion and all of the services um, and be able to sing them and chant them um, and know them in the way that somebody who had grown up with them had learned them. It's really quite a, a, astonishing to me. Um, Mary um, Kaliampu asks, many thanks, or says, many thanks for the great talk. You mentioned that a biography should not include many personal or intimate moments. Can you elaborate on that? How was this process of selection of information for you during your research? Um, so, uh, great question. Um, uh, and Ma Maria, I think, is that right? Maria Kaliampu? Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, I guess where, I, I guess I tried to discipline myself never to go after um, a question about a relationship that wasn't also motivated by uh, an intellectual question that I was looking for. And um, uh, I mean, at the same time, I want to say that the intimate letters, uh, I, I read them all. I read the 600 that I found in the uh, Center for Asian Minor Studies. I read another, um, stack of them uh, equal in size, if not larger, uh, in the Jacques de Say uh, literary um, uh, library. And um, they're incredibly beautiful. They're really beautiful pieces of literature. And so, um, uh, and so, you know, I think I was also taken by that. Um, uh, and these lines are not easy to draw, but I really think that there's a kind of ethical line, which is um, that you don't, read for the sake of um, of the intimacy. And I, I think your response actually relates to another comment about the Doucet Library where I think it must be Maria Papadaki says she was uh, denied access to letters in the Center of Asian Minor Studies when she first published the Barney Letters in 1995. So could you say something more maybe about Anna Sikelianos's role in protecting the legacy? Right. Um, so I want to acknowledge that Leah um, has been incredibly important and was also very generous in passing 
in showing to me what she knew. She really knew the archive at the Benaiki Museum very well, uh, and she knew many other sources. And so I want to acknowledge that and say, uh, and give a shout out for her um, book, which is, um, which I mentioned earlier about um, tracing the occult uh, elements in um, Angelo Sigelenos' work. Um, and, um, and I want to recognize that, you know, she published, she published this book of letters, which was her discovery of the letters in the Jacques Doucet uh, library that um, was pointed out to her and she spent a lot of time transcribing them uh, and then translating them into Greek. So that was a library that she gained access to. And when she went to the Center for Asian Minor Studies to try to find the randomly separated other, you know, a matching pair, uh, she was denied access. Um, I think in part the decade uh, between us made a difference or that it was a little bit more than a decade may have made a difference. Um, I, you know, and I also want to say that um that we people make professional decisions um also on the basis i think of um of pedigree right and so i think uh, it mattered when i made when i took my case to the center for asia minor studies and i say this you know sort of in recognition of the power that my position gives me um that you know i was able to gain access because i could say that i was writing a book and that uh, I, it was, you know, and that it was going to be published by by Princeton. So, um, uh, so these are, you know, the parts the elements of our work. Personal archives are sites of politics, and it's not just in Greece. Uh, there are many, many stories of um, descendants of artists who will not allow anyone to look at uh, or publish anything. I mean, following up on that, will that then be a challenge for you in moving this forward to include Colette and Rene Viviane? Where are their archives and how accessible are they to you? Right. Um, every single one of these um, takes time and effort. You have to track down descendants. And so uh, there, the wall is uh, wherever people, wherever you can't find um, who is that, you know, where. Actually, there's not a wall if you try very hard to find someone and can't find them. Uh, that kind of the wall falls down if you have a sense of where they are, but they don't respond. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can't find them or um, or they say no, then you have to just move on. And so, and I also think that you know we just have to create projects that are ambitious within reason uh, in order to and decide what's worth publishing uh, anyway, and if if the project is uh, stands on its own. And um, we have a comment from George Economides, who lives in Washington, D.C., and the Hudson Valley, north of New York. And um, George, half of my family lives in uh, Old Chatham, so I'm with you there, um, who says that the pandemic has allowed us to attend this presentation. And I think people are really feeling how um, wonderful it is to be able to access great scholars like yourself and to have these moments of encounter that otherwise, in a way, we wouldn't have had. So that's absolutely the silver lining of what we're all going through right now. It is, and I think it teaches us something about what we might do uh, after the pandemic is over. I think that this kind of conversation um, and accessibility is just a really wonderful thing. Um, but also I want to say that you have done a really good job of reaching out to people. And so one of our um, uh, dear friends, Yorgos Anagnostu asks a question, thank you for this wonderful talk. Your work, um, which is one, your work seems to be opening new venues of exploring ethnic Greek American history beyond ethnicity in a framework of various nodes and intersections within cultural networks, which you've written about. Would you like to share with us the prospects of this opening you see for Greek American studies? Very important question. It's a very important question, and he always always asks hard questions, and he always wants us to imagine what our next. Um, uh, project uh, will be. So, um, you know, there's been, yeah, I, 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 I want to return to the last chapter of my book at some point, if I can recover my footing uh, and really, you know, sort of say that I can um, dig in once again, because I think that at some point you need to put some space between yourself and a project. But I think that the, um, 
I think that just the network, just that network that's suggested by this kind of correspondence and the kind of traces that that opens up. Uh, looking at, for example, I think a really great project would be looking at one particular historical moment. It could be, you know, a month in 1945 uh, or, you know, a, a, a short span of time and seeing uh, what were the avenues that people were pursuing? What were the disagreements that they were having? How things were playing out in the Greek American community around Eva Sigelianos at this moment where her own story is about to be reshaped. I think it would be amazing. And that particular historical moment for Greek Americans was very, very significant. Uh, the 1940s and especially what happened just after World War II, War II was very, very significant. Um, but I think what we need to do is think about this not as a Greek American story, but as a Greek American transnational story, which also links with the anti-imperialist movement in the United States that is connecting with another a, a number of other anti-imperialist uh, movements. So we look at Greece as the first theater of operation of the Cold War, then we go to Korea, then we go to Vietnam. Those things were being discussed by these people at exactly that moment. So, um, so I think I think the way to capture this would be to try to look to to take one particular moment and try to 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 to, to develop. Uh, a picture of the scene of people talking to each other, kind of the way we're talking uh, ourselves through letters and through um, uh, various conferences that people were organizing. So another comment from Los Angeles, um, thanking you and saying, by the way, our own Atan Karas, a dancer and dance teacher here, had spent time with Eva during her last trip to Greece. And among other things, she had taught him about costume making for ancient Greek theater, performances, um, unfortunately passed away, and says, for example, he was telling the questioner that the pleats on the dresses were achieved by having thick vertical threads and thin horizontal threads. So something he learned from her. So there's that practical legacy as well in terms of craft. And that's also very important that she passed that, that down. Right, right. And thank you for the comment. And I think that it really connects with the second point that I made about legacy, uh, which is about communities of um, about intellectual communities, communities of artists, communities, sort of these, um, these communities of people that we don't really think about as having engaged with the classical. When we think about the classical, we tend to kind of keep going down the same old path, you know, uh, but for those people, it's very interactive. It is very material. It's very physical. Uh, and it takes shape in clothes and in dances um, and in the kinds of things that you pass on into um, new generations of dancers. So that, you know, it's that that's another, I think, really important uh, piece of the legacy. Another question from the Network of Modern Greek Scholars from Nicholas Kapufa. Many thanks for another great talk. You referred to their relationship in this talk as women that love women, queer, lesbian, etc. Can you perhaps talk about a bit further about your approach towards unveiling the queerness of Eva both as a person and as an intellectual? In particular, isn't this unveiling part of giving Eva her voice back, but also necessary language? similar to your comments on feminism, when it comes to understanding her sexuality as part of her contribution to the way we understand sexuality at the beginning of the century. Right, right. So um, really great question, Nikos, Nicola, and thank you for being in the audience also. Um, and um, one way to answer this is to think about terminology, but I don't want it to be just about terminology. Um, I, I, you know, I think that I can talk about the things that I wrestled with. So, so for example, we know that queer was a word that existed in uh, at that time, but it didn't have function in exactly the same way as it functions now, and it didn't have the theoretical um, uh, buildup that it has. Uh, it is a word that appears in uh, Eva's work. She talks about uh, Byzantine notation as queer. Uh, and I really love that uh, because I think that captures the queerness of her, that she was always kind of going after, the, you know, she was always going after that, um, that 
piece of history that had been ignored by someone else or had um, but had significance in itself and embracing it as a way of doing something else. So that I want to say that about queer. I really, really struggled with uh, how to talk about um, the, the intimacy uh, because um, the word lesbian is a word that is used as is sapphic. Sapphic was much more used in their uh, referring to each other than, than lesbian, but lesbian is really about imitation of lesbos and of the power of Sappho as a writer and of that inheritance. So, um, so I think I was thinking um, uh, very carefully about terminology that was in use at the time and trying to use the words that they were uh, and the descriptions that they themselves um, uh, had that were operative for them. But there is this larger category of the sapphic and the lesbian that I then make kind of the the the, the heading of this all and 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 turn into a major idea uh, in the book and I just want to acknowledge that I I do that and I do it uh, for purpose intellectual purposes. I think Dimitri's had a question he's been holding on to for a bit now. Oh yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much, Artemis, for uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation and this uh, mapping of so many strands threads. Uh, of uh, ideas, people, connections uh, at practically a, a global level. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, uh, Eva's engagement with Greek modernity, and I perhaps need to clarify that. You mentioned the ancient past uh, that she works with and uh, fills the uh, gaps uh, and inhabits them. You speak of stories about weaving, which brings us closer to a certain folk idea and even the images you used, but also the stages you follow when you talk about her in Greece, put her on ancient monuments, on imitos, mm -hmm. almost in bucolic images, kind of Arcadian almost. Mm -hmm. um, what is her engagement with something like Athens itself, uh, a modern city, mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a modern uh, industrial, uh, uh, commercial, bourgeois, working class uh, life? So when she writes 2,000 letters in agony about the fate of the Greeks, who are these Greeks uh, of modernity? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so she learned modern Greek uh, and she was very fluent in it. So that's the first thing. Uh, she was, so I, I want to acknowledge the folklorism and the excessive attention to the, the past. Uh, and, and at different times, it was the archaic past. It was mostly the archaic past, um, but then also the Byzantine past, uh, and also her attachment to the village and the landscape. There's folklorism there. There's no doubt about it. And I think that uh, in that, she was really typical of foreign travelers. Um, uh, she lived in Greece for 27 years, however, and she lived in Athens. She lived in... Um, uh, um, in uh, Maru, um, not Marusi, she lived in um, on Serifu Street, um, in Patision. She lived in Patision, uh, and she and her collaboration with uh, Cosaninos Psachos uh, was near Ayos Meletios. Uh, so, um, she you know, so she she spent a lot of time in Athens, she doesn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but she does talk a lot about modern Greek poetry, uh, influenced, of course, by uh, Angelos Sukelanos, who spent most of his time uh, in the countryside. So I think it's very, you know, it's very selective and it uh, is, um, but it is not without content. Uh, so, you know, she's friends with uh, the Palamases, she's friends with people who were, uh, you know, who were world making uh, and influencers um, in, in Athens and, uh, and part of a high society. So, you know, kind of combining the high society of Athens with uh, the village, um, the village people. Um, so I really do not want to idealize what her relationship with Greece is. I, I think it's, you know, it was selective in exactly the same way that her artistic work 
uh, was selective. And I also want to say that her political involvement in the 1940s was really dependent on the people that she was talking to in the United States and their account of what Greece was uh, to them. And, um, and it depended on her political turn uh, at that time. And I, you know, which was a time when she was also impoverished. She no longer was of, a, of the upper class. So I think it's a very, very mixed bag, but I don't think it's without content. When she talked about the Greek people, I think that she had people in mind. So I thank you, Artemis, today for being the node of our crisscrossing mm -hmm. networks here because we have uh, graduates from Bryn Mawr. We have people from Los Angeles who are writers, philalines, and also Americans. We have Vancouver uh, people, intellectuals, and university people affiliated with the center there, as well as a number of people from the Modern Greek Studies Association community. So you have managed singularly to bring all of these networks together in admiration of this really singular woman. So I can't thank you enough. Um, we did want to have you live at UCLA, but now I make a commitment to you that we will have you live at UCLA as soon as we're able. And I just want to thank you so much for just a wonderful lecture. And if we could all virtually applaud, I know everybody's sitting in their houses being very happy with this lecture right now. I want to turn over the screen to Dimitri, who will say a few words, but again, thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Dimitri, and good luck with your series uh, and with your collaboration as you go forward and also with the work, your work with communities, the communities around you. Well, uh, Artemis, thank you. And um, in, uh, in closing, um, uh, I would like to, to really thank you for uh, uh, joining us today and uh, weaving a rich fabric uh, of a talk uh, for our uh, border, uh, for our cross-border audiences. Uh, I would also really like to thank our audience. It's uh, so interesting to follow people's comments in, uh, in the chat room, uh, both in US, Canada, all the way down to uh, Buenos Aires from, uh, or not Buenos Aires, in Brazil, from, uh, from, what, I, from what I saw. Uh, I would uh, uh, like to thank our staff, uh, MEX and IT services, but also uh, Lauren Gilbert at uh, SFU and uh, Elena Varisto at, uh, at UCLA for their uh, work. Uh, that uh, is uh, how this was made uh, possible as, a, as, a, as an event. And uh, remind people that uh, at SFU, our uh, next seminar is on October 30th at 2.30 uh, and features uh, Marguerite Hagsma from uh, the University of uh, Alberta for a talk uh, titled Mapping the Margins, Introducing the Central Achaea uh, uh, and uh, Theotis uh, Survey. Uh, at the same time, at uh, UCLA, the next uh, SNF uh, presentation is coming up November 7, as part of the collaboration uh, program with the Benaki Museum. Uh, Xenia uh, Politu uh, will, uh, present, uh, 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 will present a, a, a paper titled uh, The Costumes of Women in Greece, uh, Styles and uh, uh, Preferences. Now, uh, as we leave you, uh, we would like to emphasize that these and other events uh, at SFU and UCLA individually, but also others that we hope to uh, do together, uh, are only uh, possible because of the crucial support from uh, the Stavros Niarchos uh, Foundation, but also uh, the support of uh, our uh, communities uh, in uh, Los Angeles and, uh, and Vancouver. Uh, without uh, you, this uh, would not have been something we could have been doing together. Thanks for being with us.